Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the book of Genesis, but it's titled The Book of the Beginning. We're in lesson number five for that, on that series for April 30th, 2022, entitled All Nations and Babel. All Nations and Babel. Hmm. Well, as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, these records from so long ago are a challenge for us to understand. They're ideas that are strange, people doing things we are not expecting. And Lord, we, we, we know these lessons are important. Help us to understand what's here. Even some of the intricacies of the Hebrew language that helped us to make some points clear. May we study them and understand them clearly is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Up until this time in the history of the world, the biblical record has focused primarily on single individuals, uh, with the exception, I guess, of Adam and Eve. But then there was Cain, and then there was Abel, and then there was Seth, and then we came down, we talked a little bit about Enoch, and then we, now we, then we talked about Noah. But now when we have Noah, he has three sons. And now that they have showed up on the scene, we're talking about three different individuals, each of one is doing a little, something a little different. Ham was the father of Canaan in Genesis 10, 6 and 15. It's the start of the biblical discussion of we could call it the land of Canaan, the promised land, Genesis 12, 5. Um, the place where Abraham would go later and where God promised him a future through his descendants. From Canaan, blessings were to extend all over, through all, to all the nations, all over the world, meaning to all people. The long-term focus for Genesis is God and his friend Abram, Abraham, who followed God in spite of his the influence of his family. Eventually, through Abraham would come the promised seed, with a capital S, which means the Savior. However, the short-term topic of this section of Genesis is Noah and his family. What was God's plan for Noah and his descendants after the flood? They were supposed to scatter all over the earth and repopulate the world. Do we correctly understand what it says in Genesis 9, 18 to 27? Let's see what we can make out of these, this key passage. Jim? The sons of Noah who went out from the boat were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three sons of Noah were the ancestors of all the people on the earth. Noah, who was a farmer, was the first man to plant a vineyard. After he drank some of the wine, he became drunk and took off his clothes and lay naked in his tent. When Ham, the father of Canaan, saw that what his father was naked, he went out and told his two brothers. Then Shem and Japheth took a robe and held it behind them on their shoulders. They walked backwards into the tent and covered the father, keeping their faces turned away so that not to see him naked. When Noah was sober again and learned what his youngest son had done to him, he said, A curse on Canaan. He will be a slave to his brothers. Give praise to the Lord, the God of Shem. Canaan will be the slave of Shem. May God cause Japheth to increase. May his descendants live with the people of Shem. Canaan will be the slave of Japheth. American Bible Society. Wow. What you'd see, he didn't, he didn't, do a curse or whatever it is on his son, he no. did it to the grand uh, to his grandson. Yes, yeah, actually the great grandson. It turns out, yeah. and there's a lot of strange things going on in this business. Um, I mean, think about it. Where yeah, we 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 usually don't talk about the plants, but I mean, just like all the animals that were had to be preserved in the lot in the ark. All the plants must have had to have been preserved in the ark as well. So there must have been, you know, and that, they were in there for a year, more than a year. So what did those plants do? Did they have, they couldn't plant them and let them grow? Were they soaking? What, what was happening to the plants for that whole year? Plants were hibernating too. 
Yeah. Well, well you could, you uh, know, vine, if you cut a vine of grape and you could stick it wherever, it would grow. Yeah, but uh, if, it's, if you, 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 if you set it boat. out on the deck for a year, it's not yeah, going to grow, I don't <laughs> think. <laughs> you, you went to the boat. You know yeah. that they could have a little place there. Something. Maybe they had a planetarium, or not a planetarium, but a, an ar arboretum. Arboretum, yeah. right. Yeah. With well, we need to deal more with Noah and the drinking of wine, which we must read about. Genesis 9, 21 and 22, Kerry. After he drank some of the wine, he became drunk, took off his clothes and lay naked in his tent. When Ham, the father of Canaan, saw that his father was naked, he went out and told his two brothers. That's from the Good okay, News Bible. Okay, just, yeah, we just repeated that passage. Do you think Noah had been drunk before this occasion? Well, he certainly knew how to twist a, a little alcohol out of the hey? Did he and his sons understand what had happened, why he was drunk? Did he have any idea about alcohol and what its effects were? Now, I can tell you that what How happened? Was he probably had experience with it many for many years after that. What was he at that time? He was four hundred years old. Uh, four hundred years. Six hundred and one. Okay, six hundred years. I mean, he'd had a life experience. I mean, there must have been some. They must have been known this experience if it wasn't among themselves with some other people. Yes. Now, of course, we had no, they had no refrigerators, no freezers, nothing like that. So if you squeeze some grape juice and you leave it sitting around for a couple of days, you got wine. It's not very high alcohol content, but you have wine. So the vines that Noah planted must have been carried on the ark during the flood. Does that suggest that Noah should have known about alcohol from events before the flood? Well, He was 600 years old. I can't imagine any other answer to it, that question. It says... Noah, who was a farmer, was the first man to plant a vineyard. What does that mean? Maybe they'd grown wild before that, quote, wild, end quote. Yeah? I mean, they, certainly in the Garden of Eden, they were... Yeah. It is interesting to note that Noah's act following drinking of that wine echoes in some respects Adam and Eve's story in the Garden of Eden. In both cases, there was an eating of the fruit or of the juice, resulting in nakedness, in both cases, there followed a covering, a curse, and then a blessing. Well, what do you think Ham actually saw, and what did he do? Gordon? This parallel, well, this is from the Bible study guide. This parallel suggests that Ham did not just see furtively, by accident, his father's nakedness. He went around and talked about it without... Uh, what evidence do we have about, of that? Well, he went out and told his siblings. He, he told his siblings. He, we know that for sure. We don't know how many other people he told, but at least yeah. he told his siblings, okay? He went around and talked about it without even trying to take care of his father's problem. In contrast, his brother's immediate reaction to cover their father while Ham left him naked implicitly denounced Ham's actions. The issue at stake here is more than the respect of one's parents. Failure about to, the respect to one's parents. About the respect, yeah. Failure to honor your parents, who represent your past, will affect your future. That's from Exodus 20.12 and Ephesians 6.2. Compare the curse which will influence Ham's future and that of his son Canaan. Yeah, and there are the two verses. You want to look at those? Sure. Uh, Exodus 20.12, respect your father and your mother. This is from the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. So that you may live a long time in the land that I am giving you. Good News Bible. And <clears throat> Ephesians 6.2, respect your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise added. Okay. So did Ham's actions suggest that he had lost respect for his father and his mother? Dwayne? The curse upon Ham's son from Genesis 9.25, ultimately turns out to be a message of hope. Uh, Genesis 9.25 often has been disastrously misapplied to Africans or those of African descent, and thus has been used as a religious justification for slavery. However, this bigoted interpretation does not hold for two reasons. First, the curse does not concern Ham, but his son Canaan. Neither does this curse concern Cush, 
the firstborn son of Ham, which immediately excludes the reference to those of African descent or Africans in particular. Okay, why do we say that? Okay, now here's, here's geopolitics. Where did Cain settle down? In Canaan. I mean, not Cain. Yeah, Cain. Yeah. Where did Cain settle down? In the land of Canaan. Canaan. Where did Cush go to? Into Africa, I believe. The continent of Africa. So, if we have a curse on Canaan, we're talking about someone who lives in the Middle East, not people who live in Africa. Okay? That's... Okay, go ahead. Uh, let's see here. Um, Incidentally. Incidentally, biblical genealogies, uh, see the Table of Nations in Genesis 10, are more about ethnogeography, that is, the geographic distribution of human groups, than about ethnicity, which deals with the origin of human races and languages. The very notion of race derives from the pseudoscientific, racist, and linguistic theories of the 19th century based on the theory of evolution, another evil to arise from this modern creation myth. Thus, the biblical designations of people groups such as Jephthite, Semitic, or Hamitic do not follow clear criteria of race as defined by evolution, but are much more complex and blurred. For example, although Canaanite languages are Semitic, Canaan is counted among the Hamites. Okay, so they're using a Semitic language, but they're, we, they're to, we're told that they're descendants of Ham. So here we have a, a mix-up. Okay, go ahead. Although Cush is a descendant of Ham, he is the father of Nimrod, the founder of B Babel or Babel. And where is Babel or Babel? We think it's Rock. Babylon. Two days, two Mesopotamia, days. isn't it? Yeah. So <laughs> what's, what's this guy who's supposed to be in Africa doing over in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia and, and Iraq? So this is why they're saying these things are... These things are all mixed up. Elam, who belongs to a non-Semitic people, is a son of Shem. You want to go ahead? All right. The second reason that Genesis 9.25 does not apply to Africans or those of African descent is that the reference to Canaan is an allusion to the inheritance of the Promised Land. With all of this land symbolizes concerning the promise of salvation for the world. In this context, the use of the phrase servant of servants is ironic. Servant of servants is a superlative, meaning the, the servant par excellence, and suggests a spiritual direction pointing to Jesus, the servant of servants who comes to save the world. And that's spelled out in John 13, 5. And what happens in John 13? He washes the feet of the disciples. You want to read that verse? Then he poured some water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet <coughs> and dry them with a towel around his waist. Good news, Bible. Okay. Now, just to, just to help people to sort of understand the challenges of this, uh, what ethnicity was Jesus? He was a Judean. He's a Jew, of course. But isn't descent come through your father? <sighs> No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's supposed to come through the father, right? Not in the Jewish line. It comes through the mother. Yeah, the well. It's anyway line. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, why do the Hebrews think geneal gene genealogies are so long, so important? Um, and I, I just noticed something here that, I mean, I shouldn't say just noticed, but I want to point out something here that I had noticed a while back, and I hadn't noticed it for a long time. It's genealogies, not genealogies. What's the difference? Genealogy is the study of uh, family tree. Okay, genealogy, if there was an O there, would mean a study of genetics, basically. Oh. Genealogy means a study of, ge of, of generations of, of inheritance. So it's a, a little difference, but a significant difference. Okay. So, Charles? The Bible genealogy has had three functions. First, it emphasizes the historical nature of the biblical events, which are related to people who live and died 
and whose days are precisely numbered second. Okay, let's nail that down. So they want us, they, the purpose of having these people who said he lived so long and then he had a son and then he lived many more years and then he died is to do what? These are real people. They have real lives. Well, there, it, this is an attempt for, to encourage us to see them as real people. Okay, go ahead, second. Second, it demonstrates the continuity from antiquity to the contemporary time of the writer, establishing a clear link from the past to the present. Third, it reminds us of human fragility and of the tragic effect of sin's curse and its deadly results on all the generations that have followed adult Sabbath school class, Bible study, okay. Monday, April 25. So we're going to see some of those effects now. The genealogies tell us that Adam died when Lamech, Noah's father, was 56 years old. Now I have to be a little bit cautious here. Uh, this is following one interpretation of these ages. There are three ancient, well there's two, there's the original Hebrew as we have it, which we don't have the original Hebrew. I mean, we probably have a pretty good copy, but we can't be sure of that. And then there are two ancient languages that were translated, Greek and all in uh, another language. And each of those, if you count the two translations in the original, so you got three different records, they're all quite different in the number of years that are attributed to each of these individuals. So um, I'm not trying to, you know, criticize someone's understanding of scriptures or scare them that the Bible is not reliable. I'm just saying that the ancient numbering systems. We have a number system which we're very familiar with. It's based on, on the number of 10. We go up to 9, then 10 starts over. We go up to 19, it starts over at 20. Their ancient system was based on six. Hexadecimal system. And more than that, they had, they would, the number one would be an A with a little tiny asterisk there, A prime. And that would be one, and B prime would, would be two, and C prime would be three, not except they were not A, B, and C, they were different letters as you recognize. So there's lots of ways in ancient writings for something to be rubbed off or to be misunderstood or misinterpreted. So we need to take these ages of these people with a little bit of a grain of salt. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to, anybody's, uh, these are real people. I think they're, they're, they lived in the right order. Uh, and if their ages are plus or minus a few years, I don't think we ought to worry about that too much. If you don't mind spending a couple of minutes then on this one. So the scriptures we have today are these from, say, Dead Sea Scroll, or how do you date in Dead Sea Scroll? Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. The Hebrew that we were depending upon up until about 50 years ago, and 70 years ago, I guess now, prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Hebrew we were depending on was from dated about 1000 AD. Okay. So if you think Moses wrote 1500 years BC, now by the, the, the copies we had were now 2500 years old. And they had been copied. Made and 2500 years later. Yeah. So they had been copied and copied and copied because the Hebrew idea was if the, if the text, they're, they're writing with, with basically. Uh, Papyrus. On papyrus, yeah, paper, a thin, you know, pl very simple paper, and they're writing with a very simple kind of ink, not like the nice inks we have now, and it was very easy for something to get rubbed off or something like that. <clears throat> and so the Hebrew said if a document got to a place where it looked like it had been rubbed off or something else like this, not reliable anymore, they had to sit down, make a hand copy of the whole thing and then burn the original. So literally hundreds and thousands of ancient copies were, were burned. That was, that was the, it was required by the law. That was their directions about how they had to take care of things. So then when the, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, 
even though they're not complete, we don't have every part of the Old Testament, you know, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, but we have most of it. And those now were back written about the time of Jesus. Some of them are a little before the time of Jesus, a little time a little bit after the time of Jesus. But that means all of a sudden we have documents from a thousand years further back than the ones we were depending upon. Fortunately, oh boy, fortunately, um, the, the the Dead Sea Scrolls are very, almost all of the, the things are very close to uh, to what we what we had before. So, uh, let's move on here. We were talking about Lamech, Noah's father was 56 years old when Adam died. Surely Lamech must have known Adam and heard stories about the Garden of Eden. Don't you think he would have told those to Noah, his son? And surely, I mean, yeah. I, I'm sure he, he must have. So Genesis 10 gives a long list of the descendants of Japheth, Ham, and Shem. <clears throat> Notice in verse 21, it says that Shem, the older brother of Japheth, was the ancestor of all the Hebrews. So now we know Shem was older than Japheth, and then earlier we read a passage that said that Ham was youngest. Putting all this information together, we see that Shem was the eldest, then Japheth, and then Ham. Even Jesus had two genealogies recorded for him, one in Matthew 1 and the other in Luke 3. Why do you think there's such a big difference between the list of names in Matthew 1 and the list in Luke 3? There's actually very little correspondence between the two, except in the early years. And if you, if you have a question about that, there's a, a website that you can look up and uh, <clears throat> go to, and it'll give you all, all as much as we know about the genealogies of Jesus. But there's, again, it's a question of saying, why are these, why are these genealogies important now? We just read about it. Show that these people are real. Show that the people are real, where they come from, give them some authenticity, yeah. So, we come now to next to the story of the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11, 1 to 4. At first, the people of the whole world, how many were they at that point in time? Not eight. <laughs> More than eight, but not... Well, at, coming off the ark. Yeah, eight coming off the ark, but... We don't know exactly how much later we have Babel happening here, but it, can't, it couldn't have been too many. Uh, and they used, used the same, had only one language and used the same words. We have no idea what that language was. There are theories, but nobody, nobody knows for sure. As they wandered about in the east, they came to a plain in Babylonia and settled there. They said to one another, come on, let's make bricks and bake them hard. So they had bricks to build with and tar to hold them together. They said, now let's build a city with a tower that reaches the sky so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. And if you know something about that part of the world, you know that there are still a number of those towers uh, that have been built up until relatively recent times with brick and tar. When they came out of the ark, God had commanded them to have many children and scatter throughout or through the entire world. Jim? Genesis 1, verse, excuse me, Genesis 9, verse 1. God blessed Noah and his sons and said, Have many children so that your descendants will live all over the earth. Good news Bible. So what was God to do when even after the emergency measure of the flood, the people did not follow his directions? Carrie? Uh, reading from Genesis 11, uh, the text 5 through 9. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which those men had built. And he said, Now then, these are all one people and they speak one language. This is just the beginning of what they're going to do. Soon they will be able to do anything they want. Let us go down and mix up their language so they will not understand one another. So the Lord scattered them all over the earth and they stopped building the city. The city was called Babylon because there the Lord mixed up the language of all the people and from there he scattered them all over the earth. And that's from the Good News Bible. Yeah, now it's um, calling it Babylon isn't quite accurate because it's really Babel, but 
uh, my, my translation says it's probably the same place, and so they give it the more modern name. There certainly could not have been more than a relatively few people living on the earth at that time. And they were all descendants of whom? Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? Or Noah. No, Noah. And Noah, yeah. Looking carefully at the verses we just read and comparing them with the records of creation in Genesis 1, we discover that these tower builders were using the language describing God in creation. Mm -hmm. They said, let us make a name for ourselves. What did God say? Let us make, let us make man in our image, right? That Hebrew expression is used elsewhere in the Bible only of God. And there's an example, Isaiah 63, 12 and 14. Do we know of any other creature who wanted to make a name for himself and even tried to replace God? Just one. Yes, well, maybe there's more than one, but one very preeminent one, one, prominent one, Satan himself, up in heaven. And maybe we should just look at that verse, because that's an important one. Isaiah 14, 14. You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty. The people who built the Tower of Babel were following right in the footsteps of Lucifer or Satan. It's interesting to note that they were trying to build this tower in the Valley of Shinar. It was there that Nebuchadnezzar later built his statue. Nebuchadnezzar tried to force the whole world to worship his statue of gold. So now we've got the same thing more or less happening again. And you know that story. Uh, Daniel 2, 43, and Daniel 11, 43 to 45, Revelation 16, 14 to 16 tell us that at the end of time, another Babylon will also try to do the same. Okay? From the Adult Bible Study Guide, a famous French writer, a famous secular French writer in the past century said the great purpose of humanity was to try to, quote, to try, quote, to be God, end quote. What is it about us, starting with Eve in Eden, in Genesis 3, 5, that gets drawn into, the, into this dangerous lie? Wow. Human beings have tried in many ways to reach up and somehow approach God. But the truth is that God has to come way down in order to help us. <coughs> Dwayne? The descent of God reminds us also of the principle of righteousness by faith and the process of God's grace. Whatever work we, we may perform for God, he will still have to come down to meet with us. It is not what we do for God that will bring us to him and to, redem to redemption. Instead, it is God's move toward us that will save us. In fact, the text in Genesis talks, talks twice about God coming down, which seems to imply how much he cared and what was happening there, or cared about what was happening there. According to the text, the Lord wanted to put an end to the people's deep-seated unity, which, given their fallen state, could lead only to more and more evil. That's why he chose to confuse their language, which would bring an end to their united schemes. And I, uh, you, may have, you may have heard this happen sometime, I don't know, but I have once or twice many years ago when this was a, there was, there was a time when it was kind of popular to, to put on plays of these things among high school students and so forth like that, and academy students. And to, to, just to watch happens, all of a sudden, nobody can understand what anybody else is talking about. It, it's, pretty, it, it's pretty, it's really kind of hilarious, you know? Huh? What? <laughs> it must have been very frustrating at the time, I'm sure. Everyone suddenly had receptive aphasia. Yes. <laughs> well, if you say it slower and louder and more distinctly, they'll probably understand. Isn't that, isn't that way we do things? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> anyone, anyone has experienced uh, people uh, coming out of churches and says, they'd start speaking in tongues, by the way. It happened to me more than once. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all kinds, and they're all talking in different I used to work with Hispanics in a foundry for many years. And uh, most of them didn't speak English, and I didn't speak uh, Spanish. And uh, I could have a few words like bueno, no good, and no good, or, <laughs> but facial yeah. expressions and <laughs> all kinds of yeah. things you used to. 
Okay, Charles, you want to pick up the next paragraph there? The schemes of the Babel builders ended in shame and defeat. The monument to their pride became the memorial of their folly. Yet men are continually pursuing the same course, depending upon its, itself and rejecting God's law. It is the principle that Satan tried to carry out in heaven, the same that government governed Cain in presenting his offering, Ellen White, Patriots and Prophets, 123, paragraph 3. So why, why did God want to scatter human beings out across the earth? He gave that instruction by and before the end of the flood. Look at, look at those verses again, Genesis 11, 8 and 9. So the Lord scattered them all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. The city was called Babylon, because there the Lord mixed up the language of all the people, and from there he scattered them all over the earth. God's design and blessing for humans was like they would multiply and fill the earth. Genesis 9, verse 1. Compare with Genesis 1, 28. Against God's plan, the builders of Babel preferred to stick together as the same people. One reason they said they wanted to build the city was so that they would not, quote, be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. They refused to move elsewhere, perhaps thinking that together they would be more powerful than they would be separated and scattered. And in one sense, they, they were right. Unfortunately, they sought to use their united power to, for evil, not good. They wanted to, quote, make a name for ourselves, a powerful reflection of their own arrogance and pride. Indeed, whenever humans, in open defiance of God, want to make a name for themselves, we can be sure that it won't turn out well. It never has, from our Adult Babel Study Guide for Thursday, April 28. Look at uh, something else from the Bible Study Guide about that incident, that experience, Jim. Interestingly enough, the name Babel, which means door of God, is related to the verb balal, which means confuse. I, I, let me interrupt for a second. Door of God doesn't sound so impressive. Uh, some translators change that to gateway to heaven. Or gate of God. Or gateway of God or something, uh, yeah. Bob L. Yeah. Uh, it is because they wanted to reach the door of God and because they thought of themselves as God that they ended up confused and much more powerful than before. Much less powerful. And much less powerful, I'm sorry, from the Bible study guide for Thursday, April 28. The men of Babel had determined to, govern, excuse me, to establish a government that would be independent of God. There were some among them, however, who feared the Lord, but who had been deceived by the pretensions of the ungodly and drawn into, the, into their schemes. For the sake of these faithful ones, the Lord delayed his judgments and gave the people time to reveal their true character. And God always does that. He says, be patient, let people develop their character, let them see, let us see. And, and they did, he does that with Satan. Think of how many years he waited to let Satan prove his let the wheat and the tares grow up together mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it'll become apparent. It's an, all an education process yep. for everybody, for the, those that will stick around for eternity and some those will... Not just all, education, demonstration. Well, but see, well, would, the yeah. net result is yeah. uh, education is redemption. Yeah. And, for, so you, you, and that ultimately, judgment is where a person either judges for or God's way or yep. against. So it's, mm -hmm. it's all part of the big process. Where did we end up with? As, as this was developed? In the as this was developed, the sons of God labored to turn them from their purpose. But the people were fully united in their heaven-daring undertaking. Had they gone unchecked, they would have demoralized the world in its infancy. Their confederacy was founded in rebellion, a kingdom established for self-exaltation, but in which God was to have no rule or honor. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 123, paragraph 1. Now, when we talked about the flood, we suggested that God had to send the flood because he was down to one family that were still listening to him. And what's happening here? Again, people are not listening. Same to God. story. He says if God doesn't do something, he's going to lose contact with the whole human race. 
So how often do we try to make a name for ourselves? I, uh, I believe in scientific research. And it, we've, we've been benefited in many ways by scientific research. But if you look through, you just pick a, a given scientific thing, a, a given school, for example, and you start going through the theses that have been written for doctorates for, from those schools, you realize that there's a whole lot of them that seems like there's not the, the only purpose of it was for somebody to get a degree, just to make a name for himself, discover something that someone else hasn't figured out. Well, why are we doing that? Oh, well, now I have a degree. Now I'm a PhD. Now I'm a something else. Well, um, why do we want to do that? I guess, Gordon, is that yours? Yeah. Yeah, I think this it's carries. Yeah. They decided to build a city and in it a tower of such stupendous height. These enterprises were designed to prevent the people from scattering abroad in colonies. God had directed men to disperse throughout the earth to replenish and subdue it. But these Babel builders determined to keep their community united in one body and to found a monarchy that should eventually embrace the whole earth. Thus their city would become the metropolis of a universal empire. Its glory would command the admiration and homage of the world and render the founders illustrious. A magnificent tower reaching to the heavens was intended to stand as a monument of the power and wisdom of its builders, perpetual, perpetuating their frame to the last generations. The dwellers on the plain of Shina disbelieved God's covenant that he would not again bring a flood, flood upon the earth. Many of them denied the existence of God and attributed the flood to the operation of natural causes. Others believed in a supreme being and that it was he who had destroyed the antediluvial world and their hearts like that of Cain rose up in rebellion against him. Wow. <clears throat> One object before them in the erection of the tower was to secure their own safety in case of another deluge. By carrying the structure to a much greater height than, had re than was reached by the waters of the flood, they thought to place themselves beyond all possibility of danger. And as they would be able to ascend to the region of the clouds, they hoped to ascertain the cause of the flood. I'm going to interrupt there for a little bit. <clears throat> we don't know how tall this thing was. Yeah. Do you think that they actually got up to the place where they were approaching some clouds? Clouds are pretty low sometimes in mm -hmm. some places. Yeah. They had the manpower, and there's this, probably rocks and all kinds of stuff there they could have put into it. Yeah. Certainly the Sears Tower is getting up into the clouds. Yeah. Sears Tower in Chicago. Yes. Yeah, it's up. not made out of dried brick and tar either. Well, <laughs> no. Not much different. <laughs> but to think also how many people they would need to build something like this. Yeah. And then, I mean, even if you got it up there, the flood, flood comes and they, you know, there's one little peak sticking out of the water. Are all those people going to be able to get up on that little chunk and, of... And how long do they survive? What and is how their long did, before all the... I mean, but mud, dried brick, and tar? How long does it be before all those dried brick are going to wash away? But, I mean, it seems to me like this whole thing is completely a foolish operation. But, okay, but, Carrie. Yeah? Where, were, where were any sons of God at this time? Well, there's no mention of them. No, I mean, they, they may have... Babel. What? They, they were elsewhere. They were not in Babel. Yeah, presumably. They were following the command? Presumably. I think, presumably. I think you're on to a point there that Deuteronomy 32, uh, 8 and 9, uh, when God separated the nations, it was after the, the time period we're talking about, he did it according to the sons of God. Yeah. And Israel... Descendants of Jacob, Jacob was God's special portion. Mm -hmm. So, what are they? What are the uh, the Elohim, the sons of God? What are they doing? They're twiddling them. No, they're well, very involved in educating. What What did the serpent do? He was involved in educating and deceiving uh, Adam and Eve. 
the oldest by by records that we're able to determine the oldest establishment known to archaeologists at this point in time is up not too far from Mount Ararat in southeastern Turkey and it's a very interesting thing we know very little about it it's really really strange um, and you know who knows if Maybe that's where, where the sons of Seth were while these other guys were down in the Mesopotamian Valley. So we know that there's, there were some groups that were scattered out and, and elsewhere that, other than the Valley of Shinar. You know, the, the, this took quite a, quite a cooperative social structure yeah. to do this. Mm -hmm. right? Or slave labor. Or, or sl yes, that, that was the other idea. <laughs> but it's Sh Shem, the Semites come from Shem. Mm hmm and they were scattered. Well, all of them were scattered right. eventually. Yeah. Some from Africa claim to be Semites. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah, just like, just like the, you know, we, we'd say that Israel is now a Semitic nation, descendants of Sem. But Canaan, yeah, right. that, that's from Ham. So... <laughs> okay, so Kerry. We just okay. read just from Ellen White just a short a few minutes ago or a couple minutes. For the sake of those faithful ones, the Lord delayed His judgment and yeah. gave these people time to reveal their true character. So some of the people in that were even in Babel yeah. were on God's side, and yeah. they were trying to convince the rest to now, follow God's will. I really enjoy reading these stories because it's like you're reading a real. Ex Did Ellen White see all this in vision? She must have. I mean, she describes it very... Anyway, Carrie, the whole undertaking? Probably narrated vision. Maybe. The whole undertaking was designed to exalt still further the pride of its projectors and to turn the minds of future generations away from God and lead them into idolatry. And that's from Ellen G. White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 118. Five to one nineteen one. As a church, do we ever try to make a name for ourselves? Now you're going <laughs> to meddling. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time we we placed an art, we placed an ad in the Reader's Digest. Yes, yeah, six pages got only four responses. The most expensive one ever. Yes, I know that one. Yeah. Okay, Gordon. Romans eleven twenty five. There is a secret truth, my brothers and sisters, which I want you to know, for it will keep you from thinking how wise you are. <clears throat> it is that the stubbornness of the people of Israel is not permanent, but will last only until the complete number of Gentiles comes to God. That's from Good News Bible. Okay. You want me to read the... Go ahead. Bible study from the teacher's Bible study guide, page 67, the following. The God of the nations, the creator of the world, and the Lord of Israel is the same God. This observation has two important theological implications. <clears throat> First, it means that God affects history even beyond the realms of religion. God also is present among the nations. Second, it means that the salvation of the nations also depends upon the testimony of Israel. <clears throat> the blessing of the nations will be realized only through Israel, Genesis 12, 3, for only the God of, of Israel is the true God. Well, what, another way of putting that is, <coughs> where, do we, where do we go to find out about God? The writings of the Israelites, right? The Bible. Yeah. The writings. Are there any Gentiles in there? Yes. Luke. Luke. Yeah. Yes. One. He wrote a lot, though. Mm -hmm. The lesson for the Hebrew, the lessons of the Hebrew Bible, the history of Israel, and the events that happened to the Jews, and that are recorded in the New Testament, are of redemptive significance for the nations. Okay, and so the key verse there is Genesis twelve verse three. I think Dwayne, can you take that? Yeah. The Lord said to Abram, "I will bless those who bless you." but I will curse those who curse you. And through you, I will bless all the nations. Okay, so let's think about that for a moment. What 
<clears throat> What's God saying here? You're my special pet and nobody else in the world matters? No, you have special responsibilities, special privileges, and you are going to be the teacher. You are the teacher. Mm -hmm. It's your responsibility to tell all the other nations. Okay. And they can do it. You want to pick up the next verse there, Dwayne? John, oh, I don't want to go ahead. Go ahead. John chapter 4, verse 22, 23. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well, You Samaritans do not really know whom you worship. But we Jews know whom we worship, because it is from the Jews that salvation comes. But the time is coming, and it's already, at, already here, when by the power of God's Spirit, people will worship the Father as well as He, as, as he, really, as he is. really is, offering Him the true worship that He wants. Goodness Bible. Now, is it true that salvation comes from the Jews? Yes. What does that mean? He just said it comes from God. How about all the people yeah, before there were Jews? Uh huh. Adam and Eve. Yes. Noah. Look at all those people, all the way. Abraham wasn't a Jew. Isaac wasn't a Jew. Jacob wasn't a Jew. Well, well Jew is not mentioned in the scriptures. It's Judean. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So it isn't until you come to the descendants of Judah oh. <laughs> that you have any Jews. Anyway, there are two curses mentioned soon after the end of the flood. The curse on Ham's descendant Canaan, which we've already looked at, and the curse that followed the building of the Tower of Babel. Before the children of Israel entered the land of Canaan, it was rife with immoral behavior and fertility cult religion. So these are what kind of people? Descendants of how many? Descendants of Ham. Okay, and? Canaan. Canaan, yeah. So this is now we're, we're, get, we're getting down to talking about Canaan and what, what, he, what became of him and his descendants. For example, you see Genesis 19, 5 through 7 and 31 through 33, recounting the story of Lot in Sodom and afterwards. So what, is that Lot, what does that story tell us about Lot in Sodom? Genesis 19, verses 5 to 7 and 31 to 35, now you remember, that the story leading up to this is those three people came walking down the road and Abraham rushed out and said, come on, come on in, you know, da, da, da. we'll talk about that some more later. But what, what were they on, what was, they, what was their purpose? Where were they going? They were going to Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities around. Yeah, there were more than exactly. So now when those two angels got down there, uh, they, Lot took them into his house and the people came up, they called out to Lot and asked, where are the men we, who came to stay with you tonight? Bring them out to us. The men of Sodom want to have sex with them. Ooh. <laughs> Lot went outside and closed the door behind him. He said to them, friends, I beg you, don't do such a wicked thing. The elder daughter said to his sister, our father is getting oil. Now this is jumping down later when they're living in a cave. Right. The older daughter said to his sister, our father is getting old and there are no men in the whole world to marry us so that we can have children. Come on, let's make our father drunk so that we can sleep with him and have children by him. I mean... This is after, after they've gone some distance yeah. away from Sodom. The, que the question that just blows my mind every time this happens, why didn't they go to Abraham? Pride. What are they doing out there living in a cave? Yeah, right. That night they gave him wine to drink and the elder daughter had intercourse with him, but he was so drunk that he didn't know it. Again, that's a story that's a little hard for me to understand. Is this a family program we're having? <laughs> <laughs> well, the next day the elder daughter said to her sister, I slept with him last night, now let's make him drunk again tonight and you can sleep with him. And where did they get the wine? Where, I mean, you know. The leftover wine from Ham. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> then each of us will have a child by our father. So that night they made him drunk and the youngest daughter had intercourse with him. Again, he was so drunk that he didn't know it. I don't know. This and is this was exact fertile time for both of them. You know, the timing could not be better, I guess. It seems like it. So, And the, the Edomites came out of that, I think, right? Which? The Edomites. No, the Moabites, Moabites and yeah. the Ammonites. Right, right. Yeah. Edom came out of... Jim, you want to take up there? In addition, 
The curse contains a promise of blessing, playing on the name Canaan, which is derived from the verb kana, meaning subdue. It is through the subduing of Canaan that God's people, the descendants of Shem, will enter the promised land and prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, who will enlarge Japheth in the tents of Shem. Genesis. I'm going to interrupt here for just a second. Okay, Cana means, Canaan is derived from this word to be sub, subdued or meaning subdue or something like that. Does, I mean, does this really, I mean, you, you mentioned one word like that, does that really suggest that it was put there because that can have some effect on the Israelites coming hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years later and subduing Canaan? Uh, some of this seems a little of a little bit of a stretch to me. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, the last was from Genesis 9:27. This is the prophetic allusion to the expansion of God's covenant to all nations, which will embrace Israel's message of salvation to the world. Daniel 9:27, Isaiah 66, verses 18 to 20, and Romans 11:25, which we just read a little bit ago. The curse of Ham will, in effect, be a blessing for all nations, including whichever descendants of Ham and Canaan accept the salvation offered them by the Lord. Although, Bible study guide for Sunday, April 24. Okay, so what we're seeing here is that this guy was bad, and his descendants were evil, so that gave an opportunity for God to send the Israelites in and subdue them and take over their property, and then they would carry the gospel to the world. It's not too much of a stretch based upon the, uh, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. I oh. mean, you, you, it's kind of truncated in that short two, two verses there, but. Uh, yeah. Think of the challenges that yeah. God faced dealing with these people. Soon after the flood, curses were multiplying. Fortunately, God can sometimes turn curses into good things. How does that happen, Carrie? Many years later, I'm sorry, many years later, Paul recognized that even in bad situations, God can work for good. Okay, Gary. Romans 8, verse 28. We know that in all things, God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. From the Good News Bible. Now, if you remember the King James Version, what does it say? All things work together. All for good. things work together for good. Is that true? It doesn't seem that way. No, it's not true. The word God is much earlier in the sentence, and so this is correct. We know that in all things, God works for good with those who love him, those whom he's called according to his purpose. So here's a bad situation. It, it w certainly wasn't God's ideal that these descendants of Canaan should deteriorate and deteriorate and all this kind of stuff, and so that it would provide an opportunity for the children of Israel to come in, to chase them out or whatever and, and, and take off their territory. So the curse on the people of the land of Canaan meant that one day it would become the home of God's faithful people. From that, from that location, the gospel has spread to the entire world. Hmm. But of course, we know that things did not always go well for the children of Israel. Paul recognized that and said, in Romans 11:25, that we alluded to just before, mm -hmm. there is a secret truth, my brothers and sisters, which I want you to know, for it will keep you from thinking how wise you are. It is that the stubbornness of the people of Israel is not permanent, but will last only until the complete number of Gentiles comes to God. So when these Israelites chased out the Canaanites and took over their land, they weren't all saints, <laughs> right? <laughs> the land of Canaan ended up being the home of the descendants of Abraham and the future home of Jesus, the author of our salvation. The scattering of people after the building of the Tower of Babel provided for the population of nations around the world. So we know, and there's, you know, there's of course stories, I don't know how many have read the book Contiki or the books like that have been, how did people get to those islands out in the middle of the Pacific? How do they get to Australia and so forth like this? And the stories, the theories about Pangaea, there was once one huge continent that broke up and, and who knows? Yeah. 
The story of the Tower of Babel is one of the many stories in the Bible that suggests that God can get people's attention for a little while by a sure show of force or power, but the results do what? Never last very long. So what do we see in the Old Testament? We see God does something dramatic, and everybody, oh, oh yes, oh yes, whatever you say, God, okay, fine, we'll worship you. And as soon as God lets off a little bit and says, well, but I really love you, I, I want you to, you know, to do what's right. Oh, well, I guess we don't have to worry too much. And so back to their, back to their painful ways. I mean, how many times does it go up and down, back and forth, up and down there in the Old Testament? The first inhabitants of Babylon built the Tower of Babel not because they did not believe in God, but because they did not trust him. They were trying to escape his power. Often in more modern times, some have suggested that if God would just step in and use his power to take charge of things, people would respect and reverence him more. The story of the Tower of Babel should teach us that the use of force never accomplishes what God wants most. The use of force never brings what? Freedom, love, and trust. What are we supposed to learn from the story of Babel? What were the people of Babel trying to accomplish for themselves? Were they trying to make a name for themselves? Were they trying to set up leaders and an organization in opposition to God? Were they trying to protect themselves from another flood? Did they believe God's statement that he would not send another worldwide flood? And I think, I hope we've gotten enough information that we can probably answer all those questions. Or were they, or were they primarily trying to reach the clouds to determine where all that water came from, had come from? Repeatedly down through history, humans have tried to join together to form what would, in effect, be totalitarian societies, leaving no room for the differences of opinion or disagreements. Uh, we think of the story of Babel and down through the history of the Caesars. I mean, I mean, how many people, how many great, I would call them all megalomaniacs, think of Charlemagne and think of all the de several, a number of the different Caesars all thought, okay, if we just get this all together, we could... You know, we'll just conquer the world, and we'll rule the world. And there's still some people like that in our day, aren't they? Yeah. Do we know anyone in modern history who has tried to do something like that, like what they were trying to at the Tower of Babel? Why is it the people who start out with great ideas, seeking to be holy and united and pro professors of truth, often become intolerant and proud? Jesus inspires us to live like him and avoid that mistake. Do we, but we still have plenty of megalomaniacs in our day. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, help us to understand the lessons we should learn from the experience of the, the tower builders in Babel. Um, we don't know who had the idea to build a tower or what exactly they thought they were going to do, but clearly it wasn't within your plan. Help us to not to make those kind of mistakes today, but to follow you and humble Service to others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.